That's why I love, I've always loved MIT and I'd love to pass you because you can build businesses on these licenses. Um, and it's not zero sum, you know, again, it's all about trust. So operating systems, three easy pieces. It's for some people, it's like the KNRC, it's like up there and it's by Ramsey and Andrea Apache de So, and it's a, it's like my favorite computer science book. Uh, and then, but then in the world of energy, I've kind of been learning this as we got into Tiger Beetle is that our energy sources are changing. And that's fascinating, you know, because the sun is more transactional when you switch to solar energy prices change every second, every minute, and you can be so much more efficient if you are able to, to transact energy at a much higher resolution. Hey folks, this is Alex Sabri. We have a great episode for you today. I spoke with Joran Dirtgrief, who's the co-founder at Tiger Beetle. You know, Tiger Beetle makes this financial transactions database that's really focused on not only correctness and safety, but also performance, right? Getting orders of magnitude more performance than other solutions in the space. I think Euron and, and his team are, are really interesting just in the content they put out there and the way they think about developing new databases is really interesting. A lot of interesting practices, you know, one's called the the Vopper. It's this uh, distributed simulation testing tool that helps them discover uh, distributed systems bugs, safety bugs, liveness bugs, much quicker than they would in sort of regular uh, testing scenarios and things like that. So I, I tell Euron a few times here, I, th I think he's really living in the future just in terms of how he sees you know, not only what database needs are going to be, but also development needs and, and the, the tools they're building on. So I hope you enjoy this show. Uh, as always, if you have any suggestions or comments or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. I, I'd love to hear about which guests you'd like to see on next. And other than that, enjoy the show. Joran, welcome to the show. Hey, Alex. Uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure, pleasure to be, be here with you. Absolutely. So you're the CEO and co-founder at Tiger Beetle, which is a new um, database for financial transactions, really focusing on performance and speed. And I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you because I, I sort of feel like you're living in the future in some way. Like you have these like sort of opinionated idiosyncratic views about just like how things are changing, how technologies are changing and like what the implications are for, for databases and, and how they should be built and used. So I, I'm excited to hear about that today. Um, I guess for the guests, do you want to just give them a little bit more background on, on you and your history? Yeah, well, thanks. So, so nice to hear that. I, I kind of feel like I'm just living in the past and trying to <laughs> trying to j just get a chance to put it into practice. You know, all the, the last 30 years, we've had so much research, so much hardware advance. And looking back on that, um, yeah, so a bit of background on Tiger Needle. Um, we started the project in July 2020, so just a little over three years ago. And... Um, to put that in perspective, it's, it's interesting because, again, just the timing of things. So, so we'll we'll get into all of this, you know, hardware research. Um, how do you build a distributed database today? Um, and we're just so lucky, you know, that you've got new safer systems languages, Rust and Zig. Um, so, ma so many things have changed. We've got IOU ring, um, yeah. And but at, at a high level, the the big picture of Tiger Beetle is it's something that's fast, but also small. Um, so how do you, what, what sort of OLTP database do you use today if you want to track financial transactions? Um, that, that was the question, you know, as we got into Tiger Beetle, we, we were working on a open source payment switch and this was using a, a traditional 30 years old OLTP database, MySQL. And, and that experience was, was interesting. Um, at, at the end of the day, we realized you know, we could work on this existing system and, and optimize it for a year with, with consultants and all of that cost. And maybe we could have an incremental improvement and this payment switch would be more efficient and more scalable. Um, and then we thought, well, you know, we could put this here to use and see, well, how would you build an OLTP database today for tracking financial transactions? Uh, and, and that became Tiger Beetle. How, how could, instead of being incremental, how could we, how, how could we go, you know, typically these systems do a thousand to 10,000 financial transactions a second. And that's using several, several hundred dollars a month of cloud hardware. And we wanted to say, well, how can we do a thousand times that? How can we do a million a second using the same hardware or less? So, uh, and then how can we be much safer given, given, you know, Postgres and MySQL are tried and tested for 30 years. 
we must have seen where do they fail? You know, where, where do they fail the test? Is, is that is that the case today? Are, are there are there situations where these databases are not as durable as we think or as highly available? Um, and so that that was the timing and the the context um, and the goal. You know, how, how can we be three three orders of magnitude uh, faster, but with the same unit of scale? So this was really about asking how do we optimize our unit of scale? You know, so often, you know, the cloud is, is already more than 10 years old today. And so we've actually had a lot of cloud databases that were also designed, you know, more than 10 years ago. And, you know, how have things changed? And I think in the past, it was a lot about, let's just try and scale. Like, let's forget about cost. Let's just, just scale. Let's have a design that scales. And today, I think the question is different. Today, the question that we wanted to ask was, how can we scale cost efficiently? But the way you can answer that question then is you can say, well, let's play with the unit of scale. You know, sure, we could, we could add a thousand more machines and hope that we get to a million a second, but that's very cost prohibitive. You know, um, how can we take the same machine and with that, you know, track? a million financial transactions a second. So that, that was the goal of Tiger Beetle. Absolutely. And are you building for, I guess, sort of like existing financial use cases, like giant banks and stuff that, that have these, these systems that are processing all those transactions and they need a way to scale better? Or is it like, hey, we think there's a future out there that there's just like more financial transactions or just more use cases, whether that's micropayments or like, you know, uh, in-game payments, things like that, or uh, even like usage-based Billing for SaaS, like, are you building for that new world, or is it is it also like the old world really needs this? They can't; they're having trouble scaling. Yes, yeah, so I love. I always love the question where you know it's either or, and then you answer it with yes, and you <laughs> say yes. Yeah. You know, uh, so so it's 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 or not X or and um, both. And we came at it from the context of micropayments. So this was a switch that needed to do. A lot of payments and very cost efficiently because the the value you know was was for you know five dollars or whatever. So so fees become very important at that scale. Um, and um, but but Tiger Beetle is you know it, it solves a lot of the same problems. Um, they they're all kind of interrelated. You know if you can if you can build something that can do a million a second, you can you can help the very large scale systems. Or you can trade that performance for a very small hardware footprint and be very cheap, um, and it's very easy to operate. So, so yeah, so both. But we did come at not 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 from the crypto world. I've never been involved in that, uh, but from the micro payments world, that that was the, the like the impetus for Tiger Beetle because of where the world. This is kind of interesting, you know. You touched on it, um, a future world, world where the world is going. So, gaming. You know, like you get all these economies in these massive multiplayer games. Um, and we actually had people reaching out to us saying that their database was falling over. You know, we'd have a call and their pager would literally go off. I, I kid you not, this actually happened. At the end of the call, the pager went off. They said, our ledger database is falling over because the game was doing so well. They were doing so many yeah. transactions. Uh, and uh, and then, but then in the world of energy, I've kind of been learning this as we got into Tiger Beetle is that our energy sources are changing. And that's fascinating, you know, because the sun is more transactional. When you switch to solar, energy prices change every second, every minute. And you can be so much more efficient if you are able to, to transact energy at a much higher resolution. And it turns out like existing databases, like, they struggle to keep up with this more transactional energy future. So energy systems are looking for, you know, for Tiger Beetle um, and, and then the traditional FinTech world. And then, and then that too is interesting because so much of that is moving to, to new technology now. Um, and, and then you get this problem where a lot of open source LTP isn't really online. It's not highly available. It's single node and it doesn't fail over to multiple you know, data data centers. You need to use proprietary solutions, you know, to handle that. Um, uh, but this, and, and what we also thought was, let's see if we can shrink the footprint of the system so you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. 
what would that unlock? You know, then that's what I'm really excited about. All the all the use cases that we can't imagine because you can just give people a you know three new orders of scale or efficiency, and then let them come up with you know. And again, like usage based billing, what was interesting, I heard there was actually a conference a while back, you know, with people like GitHub and, and places like that. They were actually sharing, you know, hacks for how they do billing because billing scale has increased that they can't actually track it all. So they have to like try and probabilistically charge people because they can't afford approximate it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with like serverless billing, how do you? How do you track, you know, so many seconds in a day and usage that that just explodes? Um, so if you if you have something that just very easily just thinks in a new order, uh, it becomes easier. So that was the other goal, you know, safety, performance, but also operator experience. Let's just have a like a little ant that can do a lot of work and be, you know, you sleep well at night too. Yeah, that's amazing. And that Raspberry Pi one, it kind of reminds me, we're seeing like this trend with like SQLite and Terso and different things that people are doing of just like, hey, having lots of little tiny local databases or things like that. So it's it's cool to see, I don't know, all these different changes that are happening, um, you know, giant databases in, in cloud data centers, but also small local ones as well. So Exactly. I think, yeah, it's definitely like, I love that, um, yeah, what, you know, what people are doing like Terso with SQLite and um, I learned a lot from, you know, from Glauber Costa when he wrote about IOU ring as well. That made an impact on Tiger Beetle, the SillaDB people, Red Panda, um, Martin Thompson of LMAX. Um, they all, you know, think similarly. Uh, but what I love is when, you know, people say, well, let's just allow people to have 50,000 databases, you know, uh, what, what, what'll happen when you just think, you just play with the exponent and tweak the exponent instead of being incremental because, it's just more fun, you know, and um, more efficient. So. Yep, absolutely. Um, so you just spoke at, at QCon, and I've heard just like a lot of really great things on it from Twitter, from people that were there and things like that. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I, I don't want to rehash the whole talk, but I do want to get people sort of interested and I think also set up the the problem you're looking at and, and how these technical changes impact it. So to, like one thing you say is like the OLTP workload is becoming more contentious. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Yes, so th- this was something I think like this was totally new f- new for me. Um, what's interesting with OLTP, just a bit of backdrop. Um, well, th- let's start at the beginning, and, and then then sure. we can come back to you know, to to to, to QCon. Um, what we saw, like looking at this payment switch, we were you know analyzing this payment switch where the bottlenecks, and you see that the switch is really trying to do transactions in the logical sense, business transactions, um, who, what, when, where, why, how much, it, it's business, everyday business. You know, there's counterparties, there's a, a transaction that happened in the real world. And that, that was all the switch was trying to do. And when you trace the physical SQL queries, the database queries, for every logical real world transaction, there would be 10 to 20 physical SQL queries. To impl- implement something that was quite standardized, because what the switch was really trying to do, like every business is, you're recording money, you're, you're doing double entry accounting, there's debits and credits. But it comes down to that, you know, if the database doesn't do it to begin with, next month the auditors will have to convert it into that format anyway. And so we saw the switch trying to do debit credit. Um, it, all the code was a, was that around the generic general purpose database. And you had this query amplification, which was costing you because if you if your switch can do a thousand a second, it's doing ten thousand network requests a second behind that talking to the data. So that that's very tough to you know to scale because as whenever you scale, you just multiply by ten. And typically, that's all these systems. They all have it's, it's you chat to other people, you know, in India working on the massive UPI nationwide. You know, the IMPS switch that does it, it, it crossed 10 billion real time payments in August. Um, they can't use OLTP databases anymore because they don't, it just doesn't handle scale. So they, they reinvent OLTP over durable log Kafka or, you know, Red Panda today. And then they do the transactions processing logic in Java services above Redis just because it doesn't keep up. And 
And this was really the problem is how do you do logical transactions, but we've got an impedance mismatch. Um, so coming to the contentious workload, this is the other interesting thing is that um, people, like I grew up in the era of like, um, I think we both did, you know, eventual consistency and, and let's scale, let's go horizontal. People thought Moore's law was dying 10 years ago. And so, well, we're going to have to scale out, you know, and the problem though, is that the workload that these switches do and most financial transactions is there's only so many bank accounts. And what I mean is that you could have like a hundred million customers and you could have a thousand machines and partitioning your customers across those machines. Fine. You only have so many bank accounts, like 10. So if you have a thousand machines and a thousand shards, all those shards are going to serialize and bottleneck on the one shard that has your bank account or your fees account. or it. So if this is classical, the way the real world works is you always have, on, on one side of the equation, you can go horizontal, sure. But on the contra side, there's so many bank accounts, so many energy providers, uh, so much inventory in the game. You, you're always limited. And, sh and that... So the horizontal scan out strategy works very well for S3 or key value storage. But this is what we started to ask. Does it still work well today for transactional workloads? Like for example, the, the switch could also be deployed where there's only four banks. So you literally only have four accounts. So that you just can't logically, you know, you could have four machines, but they're all going to wait on each other. So it's actually better just to have one machine and scale up. Uh, and and so this is the this is the you know the trouble of the contentious OLTP workload, but it's also we're starting to get into you know what is OLTP? Is it is it the logical real world transactions or is it database transactions? We, you know, which came first? You, yeah. you, you know who who got the name from who? Um, yeah, interesting. I, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about how yeah how you how you're solving that issue and and what implications it has. But I, I want to talk a little bit about some technical stuff because you've talked about changes in hardware, changes in like core software libraries or, or languages that are that are you know just changing what's possible and things like that so maybe walk me through this this is like um an area i try to read up on and stay up on but it's just also, also like so far removed from what i do day to day so i might ask some dumb questions but first of all like i hear a lot about iou ring what is iou ring why is it why was it such a big game changer when it was uh, released yeah so huge thanks to glaba you know he wrote this magnificent post on iou ring early 2020 that took the scales. I, I knew if I ring was thinking about it, but like, yeah, that, that post really, like I said, yeah, I mean, you, you, you've got it. Uh, the, so what is I ring? Um, so traditionally, like if you want to read and write from the disk or from the network, what's interesting is it's actually the same. It's the same essential syscall. You're reading, um, you're reading into a buffer that you provide. So you give the kernel a buffer and you say, read into this buffer from a file descriptor for me. Um, or you say to the kernel, here is a buffer that I have, write from this buffer to a file descriptor, which can be disk or network. Like I'm, I'm being, you know, this, is, this is pretty much it. Yeah, sure. Then, then you've got a problem where on Linux traditionally, you couldn't do that asynchronously. So what I mean is that if you call that syscall, your program will block um, while the kernel goes and does that work, and then it comes back and tells you it's done. And then obviously, like if 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 you you know we're all familiar with JavaScript and how Node.js works, there was that async revolution, like with libuv and Node.js, where it was like, well, we can. You, so, so the Linux didn't really have the proper APIs to do this asynchronously. So how do you let your program keep running while that task is off executing? You know, while you're waiting on the network or you're waiting on the disk, because um, you want to keep going. You know, so that you can you can do CPU and I/O. You can pipeline them. Otherwise, you're wasting CPU. Uh, and Linux didn't really have good APIs for this, and and at the same time, you know. People like Martin Thompson were talking about mechanical sympathy and um, context switches. These happen, you know, as you make the syscall, you're switching context. You know, it's 
it, it's you, you're messing with the flow of of the CPU. <laughs> and I mean, as programmers, we know like if someone interrupts you, it's expensive. <laughs> but the CPU, you know, it gets really expensive. And and this was becoming more of a thing because CPUs were getting faster. Um, and so, the and IO was getting faster. So what you saw is that the NVMe is so fast that. Um, the context switch is becoming as expensive as just doing the I.O. So the interface is starting to cost as much as the work itself. Order, of, you know, it's not exactly the same, but within the same order. Um, and so the, the interface was becoming a problem. And up until that point, people like, you know, if you understand the BV, you have a, um, a user space thread pool. So if you want to, you have a control plane, your, your program, your code is executing. If you want to do some async IO, you drop that into your user space thread pool. That will then do the blocking um, syscall to the kernel. Um, the problem is, yeah, again, context switches, you know, going across threads. So IO Uring came out um, just before and solved all of this by giving very nice ring buffers. So you have a submission queue ring buffer from user space to kernel space to send commands. And then you have a completion queue going the other direction from kernel space back to user space to give you the results of these commands. And it's just shared memory with the kernel and it's, it's pretty much efficient. So no more context switches, um, no more syscalls. You just, you just drop things at the head of a queue read things off you know the tail of the queue or vice versa and it's a beautiful design and it's very you know sympathetic to the hardware um this actually isn't the the big performance insight for target evil though so i think that's this interesting thing the, this is like a marginal incremental improvement so it's the right interface it's far more efficient um and and the reason why we used iurem is also because it's just so much easier because the Linux APIs, you're actually doing the same thing, whether you work with network or disk, but the Linux APIs for these were totally different. So you could do async networking, but not async disk. But with IOU ring, I think this is the biggest contribution is you get a unified API for doing all async network, async disk, perfect, beautiful. It's, it's perfectly efficient. It's very simple. Um, and you have one interface, so that's what I really liked. Um, you, we didn't we didn't have to go and write the BV again. Um, yeah. Okay. So you so you mentioned that's not Tiger Beetle's main performance um, secret or, or key there. Like, what is what is the the key that that Tiger Beetle is using there? Yeah. So we've got it. That's one of the cherries. One of the cherries on top. And there's yeah. a few few of those, and they all make a difference. They make five percent, ten percent, and you add all of that together. And and it's just it's the right way to do it, but it's also simpler. So you've got less yeah. kernel for if you use IO Uring, it's just it's much yeah. nicer. A, a lot of the the Tiger Beetle design decisions were just what would be quicker, what what would be the right thing, and it it would be the right no technical debt, but it it would actually just be easier and quicker and and safer, simpler. So that's kind of why we made all the decisions we did. Uh, yeah, and. The, so what was the big performance win? Um, the thing that gave us four orders of magnitude, not three. We actually got four, I think. That was this insight that is the, you know, coming back to this query impedance mismatch, logical, physical transactions. Um, we thought we have to solve this problem because we're losing an order of magnitude if your amplification is a factor of 10. So we thought, well, the information that you're really tracking is who, what, when, where, why, how much. That is in the data plane hot data, but it's actually small. You could fit that into 128 bytes. And then a lot of the big data, variable length data, that was in the control plane. You know, that was like, who are our customers? What's their favorite color? Um, and that stuff doesn't change. It's not in the data plane. Um, but the transactions that they do that's in the data plane. Um, so we realized, well, we can separate these. You know, before, it was just all mushed together. We said, well, let's separate. Let's have this idea of transactions processing. And then we take of our business transactions. And then we take our business entities out. Because they're not the business events. They're the business entities. Let's put yeah. those in a general purpose or 
what we call OLGP, you know, online general purpose processing. Let's have an OLGP control plan, Postgres or MySQL, they created that. And let's have, like, what if we had a real, like, like today, like, let's do OLTP. And, and then what we thought was, well, this is what the switch really needs is financial transactions. It's double entry debit credit. So let's pack like 10,000 debit credits in one meg. And then in a single database query, like one network round trip, you've executed 10,000 business transactions in one database. Because then you, you, again, you're playing, you know, you're, you're taking what was a problem of query amplification, you're judoing it, like inverting it and saying, well, you know, I see your 10x and I'm going to make it a fraction um, that in one request we've done 10,000. So this was the, like, the motto, you know, let's do more with less or more yeah. with the same. Because that, that way it's just so nice. You know, if you need to do a million a second, um, I don't know how many network requests is that, you know, but it, it's, you can you count it on a, you know, very easy. Much it's not, it's not yeah. 10,000 a second. Um, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So a hundred a second and you're there, you know, and we, we all know, you know, Node.js can do a hundred network requests a second. Not, not that we wrote it in Node.js. Uh, yeah. No. So speaking of what, what are you using? I, I see you're using Zig. Tell me about the choice of, of Zig for Tiger Beetle. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, like I said, so that was the big win, you know, just fixing the interface, kind of like IO Uring all over again, you know, the interface is the problem, how we talk to the database. Um, and yeah, just to add a little bit more there, well, we can come back to this. Um, I think OLAP, you know, if you compare OLAP and LTP, you get to a similar answer. But in for language, um, we prototyped Tiger Beetle in five hours. Um, just a quick performance sketch of network protocol, if sync, check summing, what would the whole thing do? And we saw, well, this could do like 400,000 a second, just fixing this impedance mismatch. And, and this also solves the contention problem. Uh, interestingly enough, because it gets rid of Ronox within the database. Uh, but then coming to language now, we thought, again, you know, what's the right thing? You know, should we invest in systems languages of the last 30 years, like C or C++? Um, and obviously, you know, like writing a distributed database like Tiger Beetle, it's a big investment, so it's going to take time. We're going to take time to... Um, you know, to, to build this and we're three years in and, and coming to our first production release. So, we, which is pretty quick, but it's still three years is, is long. So we also realized, well, we've got three years grace. So we don't have to pick something in 2020 that is as widely adopted as, as Rust was then. We could actually just pick what we thought would make the best choice or a database. And this comes to like uh, hardware advances. So our feeling then was that context switches are more expensive. But the other thing was that um, CPUs are really fast. Disks were becoming really fast with the NVMe. Networks also. You can strike the disks if you ever have a disk bandwidth problem. You can just strike. Networks, you know, they're, they're so big, the pipes. Network latency isn't going to change, but Bandwidth is is just increasing, but memory bandwidth—that's the thing, you know. Because you can't if you if you have a CPU socket, how do you stripe memory on it? Like just to increase your memory bandwidth, you can't really, you know. It, it's like capped. And so we thought, well, this is really where it's this is going to be our thing, you know. You know, numbers. Every programmer should know. We've got the different colored columns, like blue, red, green. I don't know which color the memory column was. I think it was green, but we said. In the past, we used to think of disk seeks and spinning disk as the problem. Let's just move into another column. Let's see memory bandwidth as the problem. So, and then, like coming out of that, then the decision was Zig. It, it could have it could have been Rust, but we wanted a, like a single threaded control plane because we thought we don't you know context switches. We don't actually want multi-threading anymore. Um, fearless concurrency. We just wanted. Simple single threaded control plane. It's easier. Um, so the borrower checker, you know, could still have helped us with logical data races on a single thread with concurrency. Um, we, but the memory efficiency sort of won the day because Zig is obviously great. You know, you, you can 
you can choose your allocator and you, you can be very specific around alignment in the type system. We wanted to do direct IO because again, you can save memory copies to the page cache because you don't use the page cache. Um, so it was all about memory, like zero copy, zero deserialization. The, these are again, those cherries, but they add up. Um, and so we picked Zig because it's just so precise. We didn't see anything to us that seemed more efficient for working with memory, like just being really sharp or around memory layout. But the other thing is Zig fixed all the problems with C. So C would have been the other choice because we had to, we, we couldn't choose Rust because we, we had to handle allocation failure. That was like a thing. We adopted NASA's power of 10 rules for safety critical code. One of the rules is static memory allocation, which we, we don't see that in the C sense, you know, um, in your stack. We see that as, okay, you can use dynamic allocation at startup, but there's an initialization phase, you allocate everything you need, and then at runtime, there's no more malloc or free. So everything is statically known, like in the, in the logical sense of the word. So your, all your memory is statically allocated, you have limits on everything. But Zig again was better for this because we could handle memory allocation failure at startup and during runtime, you know, we could use the standard lab and know that there's going to be no hidden allocation. So we actually didn't want abstractions, you know, abstractions always carry a cost. They've got a probability of being neat. And so yeah, I, in the zero cost thing, I, I was nervous about that. We wanted less abstractions, excellent, a, a minimum of excellent abstractions is how we put it. And Zig yeah. was very ex explicit about all this. So, um, those, those are just some of the reasons, but. It, it just seemed, you know, such a small language and comp time is so powerful. I, I, again, like safety macros can be really dangerous. Um, yeah. So we didn't want macros. We wanted comp time and we wanted to do shared memory with the kernel. Um, and we, we use a lot of intrusive um, data structures in Tiger Beetle because it is simpler and safer in a logical sense. And Zig is just very natural for, for doing that. So the, and, and the code is very readable. So the switch happened to be the community around that switch was JavaScript developers. And we said, well, hey, Zig reads like TypeScript, you know? Um, yeah. So they, they wouldn't be able to write it, but they could understand it. So that was quite a, a big win. Yeah, very cool. Another thing I hear you and the Tiger Be Beetle folks talk about a lot is protocol aware recovery. What's maybe just tell me a little bit of background behind that paper, what the implications are and, and what that means for you, you know, building a database. Yeah. Well, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah. So th this was again, just being lucky with timing, you know, um, yeah. uh, we, because we thought, well, we can solve the interface. Um, you've got low latency batching. You actually get better latency because your system has more throughput. So there's less queuing. It's ca kind of counterintuitive, but. You have a new database interface and you can just do, you know, 10,000 per query. We've got this really efficient, memory efficient language. We've got IO Um, but we realized like, if you're going to say to a payment switch, okay, we've, we've got a new OLTP database for you. It's going to be as safe as something that's 30 years tried and tested. They're still going to be nervous. They're going to yeah. say, well, see us in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> like it, yep. I, I, it's great, you know, but really it's table stakes. Um, yeah. So we realized it's not enough to be as safe as Postgres or MySQL. But then like my, my hobby was always following the FOST conference in Santa Clara. And that was all the storage fault research from around 2008 over the last decade coming from Wisconsin, Madison. So I don't know if you like, if you've read OSTEP, Operating Systems, Three Using Pieces. No, I haven't read that one. Right, write it okay, down. I'll link that in the show notes. Great. Okay, cool. So operating systems, three easy pieces. It's for some people, it's like the KNRC. It's like up there, and it's by Ramsey and Andrea Apache Dusso. And it's a, it's like my favorite computer science book. I actually wrote to Ramsey. I said, you know, it used to be KNR, and now it's yours. Uh, and I'm, I meant it because it's got so many great research papers at the end of every chapter. They've got these great key examples all the way through. Um, how to understand an operating system in terms of memory, concurrency, and storage, I believe. Um, yeah, or 
pro, yeah, pro, maybe just the process model. I'm not sure. But they, those same authors have sort of um, been the vanguard of all the storage fault research coming out of Wisconsin Medicine. So True. looking into file systems, all the file system bugs, do file systems give us durability? Answer is no, they don't. ZFS does. That's sort of the, the answer. And again, for databases, uh, and there it was very interesting because like you, you will know like 2018, there was F-Sync gate. So Craig R Ringer, you know, he ran into real data loss actually because of Postgres, not there, there was like a latent sector error on the disk and like a temporary IO error, but he actually lost data because of a routine fault that could have been correctly handled by the database. And the kernel was also to blame. Again, the interface was surprising. But still, you know, with direct IO, this this could have been avoided. And so that was 2018, and then it affected like almost everybody, you know, my SQL, I think SQL I Postgres. And everybody patched it by crashing the database. And at startup, they come back and read the write ahead log and rec recover from the log. That's how they solved FSync it. And then in 2020, like literally, I think a month before the design of Tiger Beetle, UW Madison came out with the paper, can applications recover from FSync failure? And they looked into FSync gate and, and asked the question, was the, did the fix work? And it didn't. Be, and the reason is because the databases would come back after the crash, recover from the writing head log, but they didn't use direct IO. So they, were, they didn't realize they were actually reading from the kernel page cache in memory rather than recovering like from what's Jeruby on disk. So the database is now externalizing decisions to users and saying, okay, I committed your transaction. And actually like that transaction data was only in the page cache, not never Jeruby. So still the same problem. And Postgres, was, you know, they, and after in 2018, they immediately started with um, direct IO it's still not in, you know, it, it, yeah. some of it is in and I, I'm not sure how far now, but the last few months, it, it's still it, like sort of preview mode, get, you know, getting into production. So the, this is, you know, how do you fix Fs and get, you really need direct IO. But then the same people from Madison, well, that same, well, in 2018, they had this paper, like you, you mentioned, protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage. And this was asking, so if Gate was about a single node database, like MySQL, um, Postgres, one machine, and you have just one sector fail, and, and you see the database accelerates that into data loss. Um, in Protocol Aware Recovery took that storage fault model that basically just to say disks do fail is ZFS, you know, it has been leading the charge. And protocol aware recovery took this world of storage research, which was like one discipline, one domain. And then you had the world of distributed systems was a whole nother department. And in the distributed systems world, like you had Paxos and Raft and they would have formal proofs and they, the formal proof would say, you can't use the clock. You know, you have to have logical timestamps. You can't depend on physical time and you have to. You, you, you can't trust the network. The network has a fault model, you know, packets are dropped. Even if you use TCP, you know, you can't get total order out of TCP. Otherwise we wouldn't need consensus, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. but TCP connections get dropped, you know, and, and then a lot of bits are off. So then, you know, comes Paxos and Raft and they had formal proofs and the, the model was like, yes, network fails, clock can't be trusted. You know, you can't, you've got to solve this problem without using clocks and then Processes crash, and that was it. And then they said, for storage, yes, we're going to depend on storage to write the votes. You know, each each node is going to remember the vote that it makes. It's going to record that vote to stable storage, so it doesn't backtrack. You know, once you make a promise, you, you you've got to keep that promise, yeah. otherwise you go into slippering. So that that's how all these systems worked in the distributed world. And UW Madison said, well, it's interesting, you know, that you say storage is stable, that it's perfect and pristine because that's not actually it's not true. Yeah. the reality, you know, uh, yeah. because users, again, you know, had already seen this with Postgres, with Epstein Gate, like you get real data loss. So they, they asked the question, well, let's take like a, a replicated database, you know, any of the well-known ones, 
let's put a single SIF default on one machine. So you've got a cluster of five. We'll just corrupt one sector in the log of one of the machines. And then they found that that would actually result in global cluster DDoS. And that, that really surprised everybody because people thought, well, redundancy implies fault tolerance. And UW Manistee came out with a paper before Protocol Aware and they said, well, redundancy does not imply fault tolerance. And yeah. then Protocol Aware Recovery was, well, how do you actually build a distributed database if you if you assume there is also a storage fault model? If you you know, if you're gonna have a formal proof, is there also a storage fault model? So we took Protocol Aware Recovery and there's there's like two big papers behind Tiger Beetle and there's a there's a few, but you know, there's Vstand replication as our consensus protocol. Um, because that was the only one that actually worked completely in memory. So I thought, well, this is not only the first consensus a year before Paxos. It, to me, it was easier to understand than Raft, the 2012 paper. But it also seemed to have good sensibility that you shouldn't trust the disk. It's just easier to get this right if you, if you don't have to trust the disk to be perfect. So we started with that. But the second paper that was key was Protocol Aware Recovery because that showed us how we could actually do storage, stable storage for our consensus protocol. We obviously don't want to be in memory. We want to get it to disk at some point. So how do you do this? Um, the, the, the nice thing with this, yeah. what is really cool, it's so obvious, you know, people say, well, why not just run Z-RAID underneath each node in your cluster and use local redundancy? Z-RAID would, would solve your storage fault model. The problem is, you know, if you have a cluster of three and you do Z-RAID three times on each, you've got a storage overhead of 9x, which is expensive. So, so again, at yeah. scale, like you've, you've 10x your, your cost. And what Protocol Aware said is, why do you need local redundancy if you already have replication, like you have global replication, why, why are we still writing LSM trees as one component and consensus protocols, you know, in different departments, you know, the ComSci building, let's integrate these worlds. Let's say, you know, if you find a local storage fault, you can, you are allowed to use your consensus product to, to recover locally, but actually most systems don't do this. So. Tiger Beetle, you know, if it finds a local storage fault, it'll actually use the consensus protocol to heal itself. And it, it, everything is integrated like this so that you get the sufficiency just for three X overhead. Gotcha. Anyway, and so just yeah, so I that's, understand, that's like, a lot, yeah, a lot of background. no, no, this is great. So <laughs> protocol aware is just saying like, you can't have your storage over here, your, your sort of consensus system over here and be isolated from each other. They really need to be integrated because if, if one fails, like you need to understand how to recover from that. Uh, you know, in a coherent way. It, exactly. Because what, what would happen is, you know, the local storage engines, they would see the disk sector in their log. They would say, oh, I, okay, I do have checksums, yes. And I see the checksum doesn't match. And they would then say, therefore, the power must have failed while I was writing to my log. And they truncate the log back in time, which is fine if that was the case. But if it's actually bit rot in the middle of your log and you truncate, you're actually truncating committed transactions on that local node. And in the context of consensus, you're truncating your votes. So now you've just gone into split brain. So that, that is the problem. So this pr protocol is two things. Um, you can't be correct as a distributed system if your storage is not integrated with consensus. You, you cannot be correct. It's not safe if you assume storage faults and if you're not running on Z-RAID. So you could solve it with Z-RAID, but again, efficiency. Um, the second contribution of the paper was that you can have higher availability if your local storage can heal itself using global redundancy. So if you have global redundancy, why not use it to recover from faults? It, it, it's basically distributed RAID and that's the protocol way paper. You know, it's hard you do distributed RAID. Which is which is fun. Okay, so that's like a bunch of background on like I'd say research or tech improvements or things like that, and and now just like getting into what are the idiosyncratic ways about how you build Tiger Beetle and and the, the Tiger style and all that sort of stuff. And I think sort of flowing directly from that 
protocol aware recovery, like, hey, you're building your own consensus and storage that need to, you know, be tightly integrated and know about each other. And like you're saying, people want to see a lot of history. They want to see 30 years of um, testing and reliability on that. So tell me about Voper and, and what's that, what, what Voper is doing and how that's sort of helping you. Okay, cool. So again, it com comes back to that question, you know, it's not enough to be as safe as something that's 30 years tried to test it we actually realized we'll we'll have to make people nervous like like yeah. they if, if you know but the good news was you had like uw madison had done this people we had this great research just waiting to be implemented you know from the past you know since 2008 these amazing papers they used to win best paper every year at fast and yeah. in some years i think they didn't present to give people a chance. You know, that's, well, that, that's our <laughs> joke, not theirs. But um, yeah. it's it's an amazing research, and um, and ZFS had done this already, and we were like, well, let's just go and do this because we've got the opportunity. It, it, the timing is perfect. We're just lucky, you know. And so we we could actually be so much safer because we could handle. We had that you know thirty years of hindsight. Now we can we could solve things that. For Postgres, it was really difficult. They're still trying to retrofit direct IO because it was never designed for asynchronous direct IO. But we designed from the very beginning for these things, IO, urine, direct IO. So it was easy for Tiger Beetle. It was just the easiest way to do it. But then again, now you're building your own consensus, building your own storage engine. And we kind of, we had to do that because the existing off-the-shelf solutions were not safe. They didn't have a storage fault model. So it... It, and we wanted to just do it the right way, but do it quicker. Um, so, and just one more example, you know, where these systems don't follow protocol aware, what you will find is they have two writing head logs. So RocksDB or, or LevelDB or whatever the storage engine is, that has its writing head log. And the consensus protocol Raft has its writing head log. So you're just halving your throughput through the writing head log. And most systems are like this, you know, off the shelf Raft, plus storage engine and now but if you integrate the two you only have one right of the log so it's it's nicer you know and you, yeah. when you're building these systems you feel better because you, you know like there's only one right head log and it's it's like efficient you haven't halved your you know your, you haven't doubled your epsyncs but how do you test this so there again like we were it's just timing you know so foundation db they had i had done a lot of fuzzing um and also simulation testing, kind of like Jepson, you know, where you do storage fault injection uh, and done a lot of that and seen that's really powerful. Uh, but then Foundation DB took that to the next level and they said, well, if you design your distributed database so that you've got a very nice replicated state machine architecture, you have a write ahead log, you run that through an in memory state machine. And at some point, that overflows to disk to your storage engine. But if all those components are deterministic in your software, if you abstract time in terms of logical ticks, and you're just careful, like message passing on the network, you're not leaking IPv4 everywhere, um, you're not doing multi-threading in your control plane code, you, you're just architecting cleanly, then you can actually shun the non-deterministic elements you know, of thread scheduling or, or timing or I.O. You can shim those, but again, because you have storage fault models or network fault models, like you could do message passing and, and in your interface have a very narrow interface and say, we'll send a message to a node and receive a message. Messages can be dropped, reordered, duplicated, whatever. And you actually make that very explicit. Then you have a very narrow network interface, but the same with storage. You just say, well, the disk is going to forget or write to the wrong place. It's fine. And now you've got two very simple you know, interfaces, then you can shim those and then you start to like run your whole distributed cluster in a virtual simulation where you your network and storage is deterministic and you can do fault injection, but in a way that is repeatable. So if you find a bug, you can replay it again and again and again from a random seed. You generate a whole, you know, chaotic universe. It's like chaos engineering, but it's deterministic. Yeah. It's used like the tension, you know, yeah. it, it just comes from computer games. You know, those like those randomly generated levels from a, it all comes from a number and it explodes out. But if you do that, you can, you've got this reproducibility and that, so this is kind of answering the question, like we've got to be much safer, but we've also got to 
these systems take 10 years or 30 years to build. So how do we build it in three years? And again, here's the answer, because normally if you're testing a distributed system, you have a bug, it can take you, I've, I've had it before with systems where we knew it was there and it took us a year to finally find it and fix it. And you know it's there in a distributed system, you just can't reproduce it, you, you hunt it for a year. And you can't afford that. So we thought, well, if we have a deterministic simulation, you know, testing um, environment, we don't have that problem anymore. And then finally, yeah, the second part of the answer is that if you have a simulation, you can speed up time. You know, if you have yeah. abstracted time, you can then speed it up. And that's the big um, difference between how we test and how Jepson would test because Jepson can't speed up time. So with Jepson, if you want to find a two-year bug, you have to run it for two years. Um, with with Tiger Beetle, we can tick time in a while tree loop. So you, we worked it out. You actually, we end up running about seven hundred times faster. So that's the acceleration factor. That's amazing. Yeah. So in one second, you've done seven hundred seconds. In three seconds, you've done thirty-nine minutes. Um, in a day, you've done two years, and that's on one core. And then what we do is we run 10 of, like you said, it's the VAPA simulator. We run 10 of these VAPAs just 24 seven. So every day we do 20 years of like, you know, real time testing, but we can actually play with time. Uh, and, and the, the name just comes from war games. You know, that's the ultimate inspiration. You know, let's they, simulate they, in war games. There was the WAPA, the war Whopper. operation, I don't know, planning and response. So we we had u stamped uh, replication, and we said, well, let's call it the VAPA u stamped <laughs> oper operation replicator. Um, but the funny thing, Alex, is like we used to, if we didn't implement protocol aware just right, and there were cases where we were slightly not as efficient as we could have been, the VAPA would find those cases and say, you know, your cluster has become unavailable or deadlocked because of a storage fault sooner than it should have. Um, all correctness bugs, and it was interesting how the simulator found the research. Like it, 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 it that was quite amazing, you know. And only if we implemented protocol recovery could we actually handle it correctly and with you know with optimal availability. It's amazing how this like it feeds back on each other. And I remember like a few months ago, the Vopper had found a bug, and you, you all the team just like live streamed, sort of like reproducing it, figuring out what's going on. And it was just like so interesting to to see that all work. I guess like how often is is Vopper finding a bug? Is that a regular thing, or is that like pretty rare for that to happen at this point? What's that look like? Yeah, at this point, so it runs. We've got it hooked up. Um, you know, ten of them running, and if they find something, they automatically classify it as either violation of strict serializability, so correctness. It, it can know that already. Um, so it checks strict serializability like Jepson would, except it can check it as things are running using a recorded history. Um, it can also like check a lot of things because it controls the world. It can actually check a, a given Tiger Beetle node. It can go and look at the page cache that we have in user space, and it can compare that to disk and see that we can check and verify that we cache coherent. Uh, so it can do all these really cool checks. Um, and it doesn't really find bugs anymore unless we play with the protocol. So what's very nice now is we've got a way to climb mountains safely. So we can do a lot more climbing. Like we can really push the protocol and do very nice, simple things. Um, but I think people normally wouldn't do them if they didn't have these safety techniques because you 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 just can't climb as creatively as you can you know if you if you're safe like this. Um, so we it it kind of depends you know are we doing new protocol work then we do find bugs. Um, yeah, and we we still we we're doing a lot of work on the Vapa you know to there's, there's still a ton of stuff we can do. But the first time we switched it on. Like we, I think we built Tiger Beetle for a year. We always planned it for this testing so that it was architected for it. Then it took three weeks to create the VAPA, you know, the first one. But when we switched it on, like the sensation of actually accelerating time, um, like we fixed 30 bugs in three weeks and they were all tough distributed systems bugs. So we could fix five a day. 
because um, you know that live stream you watched that was a three hour stream so that was a tough bug still took three hours but would have taken a few months otherwise but just that feeling that you get you know so um and again like thanks to foundation yeah, yeah very cool well I mean, I think the Voper's so interesting and like, I want, there's so many other like unique practices. I love the the tiger style doc you have. I'll link that in the, in the show notes and how you think about assertions and the static memory allocation, like lots of cool stuff there. Uh, we're getting close on time and I do want to talk like some business stuff just a little bit, because I think it's interesting. Yeah. Like one, one issue you mentioned is just like the trust issue when you're building a database, how long does it take? You know, it, it takes a lot of building and then showing that trust and reliability to get people to, to go over it. So we talked about that with Voper. Um, I also want to talk to you just about like open source. So, you know, Tiger Beetle is Apache 2. We've seen a lot of um, databases or tools lately switch to BSL, uh, the business source license or, or things like that. I guess, how do you think about open source and, and, and the BSL or what do you think about that? Yeah, thanks. So... Yeah. It, again, like it's all about building trust, you know, yeah. build trust. So I, I studied accounting and my professors, I'm really thankful because the one thing they would drill into us, they would ask the question, what do auditors, you know, the big four, what do they sell? And the answer was trust. And I think yeah. in software, like so much comes down to trust. At the end of the day, it's about trust. So you can, I think this is what people miss is the business side as I think as engineers, we retreat and we say, well, we don't know much about business, so we're going to choose the license that has business in the title because obviously <laughs> a monopoly is the way to build a great business. But I think you can build amazing businesses that are, they don't have to be monopolies. It's not zero sum. Mm -hmm. If you understand that business at the end of the day is about trust, how do you build trust? And I don't think you build trust by saying to your future customers, hey, you should you should depend on this critical dependency, but you know what? It's going to be a monopoly. It's going to be one business that can support it. I don't think you build trust like that. And I don't, I don't actually think, I think we should be more, as engineers, I would like us to be, I come from a business background. I think the way I look about, you know, think about open source licenses is I always ask the question, what's good for business? Is it free? Is it permissive? Because if, if you can't have a lot of entrepreneurs building businesses on this, it's not a great, I, I, in my book, you know, um, business license. Um, yeah. So I, that's why I love, I've always loved MIT and I've loved Apache because you can build businesses on these licenses. Um, and it's not zero sum, you know, again, it's all about trust. So, uh, you know, your customers want to trust you and they do trust you, but they also want to trust that if something happens to your corporate entity, well, there's another one, you know, um, mm -hmm. that, that is better for business. Um, if you look at if you look at things, you know, as a system, you know, as an ecosystem, um, and it, if you want to build a great business, you can't think only, you know, of your little castle. You have to think of the fields beyond it, and you really want to get your cavalry into the field. You don't want to be defensive, digging moats. No one wins yeah. a war like that. You know, you actually yeah. want to have the best cavalry in the field. Just yeah. go and innovate, make a technical contribution, builds trust. This idea that we're going to lob four-year-old open source over the wall, I, I, I don't know. I'm yep. happy, you know, I've got friends that, you know, that have, you know, thought they needed to do that. Um, and that's great. It's a different philosophy, but I don't think, it's not great for business. You know, I think you get yeah. far more business if, if you just open source. And we've also, I mean, we have this legacy, you know, we had people, the previous generation fought hard for open source. And our generation, I see... You know, people are saying it's. We we, we say, well, we're engineers. What do we know about business? But actually, I think I wish people would just say, you know what, let's just build trust and yeah, let's just just be good. Um, yeah, yeah. What about? I mean, that trust is such an interesting one. Is, and is there a way that you can sort of uh, more permanently lock in some of that trust or things like that? Because like one thing that's difficult is we've seen companies that that talked about open source talked a good open source game for a while and then all this and built up that trust it seemed like and then you know once it got to day two and 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 things like that now it's like hey now we're bsl going forward so like i i mean yeah. it, it's probably hard to donate your database to like the linux foundation you know like that wouldn't be um great but like is are there are there ways you can sort of like lock in that trust to where it's not just you know subject to the whims of uh, of the company and whoever happens to be in leadership but you know in five ten years as well 
Yeah, I think that's also good. So we like Tiger Beetle came out of Payment Switch, which was a Apache two. So we had to be a Apache two by contract. So that that's nice, you know. Um, so we are a Apache two. Um, I think the other thing it always it, often what you find is when people bait and switch, it's new management, you know, and maybe they don't understand open source. They actually because it's always like, how do people play chess? Are they trying to just capture you know material on the board, like just capture a pawn or are they actually trying to win the game and that's always my question are they thinking second order because everyone is thinking business you know bsl first order oh sleep well at night actually if you look at it like you know, red panda rewrote kafka i don't know how many years in seven years in they didn't even want kafka source they just said well things have changed we're going to rewrite it you know um so BSL wouldn't have given, not that Kafka are BSL, but it actually doesn't give you protection, the defense you think, because by the time someone is going to compete with you, things have changed, they'll rewrite. And again, you know, competition happens at the interface, not at the implementation. So you can license, and this is my feeling, but you can license the implementation. People always compete on the interface. It's going to be, you know, Kafka dropping replacement. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan, obviously, of Red Pandal. Um, but I, I think that story is interesting that, um, yeah, so I, I think if you want to build trust, you also don't want to lock people in because it's it's kind of hard to sell, you know, if, if you're saying to someone, I'm going to lock you in. And, and, and there's a better way to do it. You don't, you don't need to. If, if you have trust, that's actually where the value is. So, which I think for engineers resonates with all of us because we, we all want to build trust. And, and it's just that we've, we had this, you know, a little bit of first order thinking, but actually second order thinking is, is where it's at. Uh, yep. Yeah. You're talking about selling and I know you're coming up on like production release of Tiger Beetle. Like w what does selling look like for you? Is it support contracts? Is it a hosted Tiger Beetle? Is it something different? What will that look like? Yeah. So it's, it's trust and time, you know, and the startups don't have time. Open source is too expensive. It's not free for yeah. them. You know, they need someone yeah. to manage it for them because they don't have time to set up managed environments a lot of work into that um and at scale it's trust you know so you can give someone free open source but they they want to know you know who do i call if um so it's it's all about trust you don't need need to lock them in they, they want to pay you know pay pay you to to be there for them and have a relationship a, a real relationship so that's sort of how we you know we think about it on those two that and that was my own journey i didn't know any of this you know coming into tiger beetle i always thought gave me goosebumps you know what you could do with all these changes around testing and safety and performance but i was still figuring out the open source model but this is what i learned you know pe people just want trust and and save them time yep absolutely well you we're coming up on time um i've just loved this conversation which doesn't surprise me. I think you have like one of the highest signal Twitter accounts. Um, Tiger Beetle has a great newsletter, great, great blog, all sorts of stuff. Like I just learned um, just amazing stuff. And I really think that you have this insight into the, it feels like you're living in the future, truly, like just some of the insights you have. So I, I really appreciate you coming on. Like wh where can people find you if they want to, you know, learn more about you or, or about Tiger Beetle? Yeah, so we like the whole team, we're very accessible. Just come and jump in, you know, on, on GitHub. Um, Love to see you there on Twitter, Slack, any anywhere you find us. I'm happy to set up calls to chat. Um, yeah, and Alex, thanks to you because um, yeah, uh, this has just such been such a pleasure. You know, it's, um, thanks thanks for for having me. Absolutely, thanks thanks everyone for coming on. See ya.